good. Okay? To those who love God. Qualification in the statement. This happens not for everybody in the world. This happens for people who love God. Another qualification. For those who are called according to His purpose. In other words, these people that God has drawn to Himself for salvation. How is He going to make that decision? Who is He going to call to Himself? For those whom He foreknew. That is the basis on which God does this work as sovereign God. Some people don't like this concept, but I think it's the only way you can truly understand how God is at work. He truly does grant free will within the limitations that He establishes, and He lets us suffer the consequences of those choices. But, He knows who's going to say yes. And he knows he's going to say no. He didn't make them say yes, nor did he make them say no, because that would take away free will. But he knows he's going to respond. And so he can act and function in calling and election and enlightenment and all of those things because he knows who's going to respond. Now, as you go further in this, he does predestine some state. Because they get this confused that the predestined part is to be lost or saved. Please look at that carefully. Those whom he foreknew that would respond, right? Those who are going to respond to be saved. What does predestination do? It causes something to happen to them. And it's not that it's going to happen to everybody. But those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Which means that I am going to be like Jesus. You, if you're a born again child of God, are going to be like Jesus. And you don't have to worry about whether it's going to happen or not. Because He is the Lord of salvation. He is going to, as you respond, He is going to make you just in the eyes of God with His righteousness. He is going to guarantee a process in which if you are truly born again, you're going to with setbacks and fights and battles with your flesh, but ultimately be becoming more and more like Jesus because you've been set apart. So there will be a process of holiness that is developing. The scripture calls it sanctification. And that word sanctification has got the word sanctify in it, which means to be made whole. And he's going to complete the job. And that's called glorification, in which the very glory of Jesus will, will shine from our lives and we will be complete. And so he's predestined that final work of salvation. Everything is going to happen. We're going to be conformed to the image of his son. Amen? Amen. So that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren. We will be like him. He's the first human person who dealt with sin and did not sin. As the Son of God, He is the God-man, the one unique Son of God. And as you and I follow Him, we're going to have not Godness. That is not what that passage is saying. If you got that idea, whoever gave it to you, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Folks, the devil is trying to get us to believe that somehow we're going to be a God. Did you not get that in, the, in the, the temptation of Adam and Eve? Did God say? There's doubt. So here comes Satan. He, he gets himself into this place in their life where now he can begin to work things around. And he says, oh, you know, boy, look, it's good. She's, yeah, it looks really great and everything. And so as he's snaked his way into that, and this is Satan. The, uh, the book of Revelation clearly identifies the serpent in Genesis as Satan. If you didn't know it, but it's there. And as he's doing this work, he says to them, to, to eat. Did, did God say to create a doubt? And then he says, oh, look, let's look at the benefits of this. See, if you get involved with like this, you will be like God. You will be like God. You'll know good from evil. You'll have all of that. And so 
when we are dealing with the reality of the fact that we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, it talks about character and, and nature. It doesn't talk about essence of being. There's only one God. Remember how many gods did God say there was? One. He revealed Himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. Three distinct persons, but only one God. We say, that doesn't work in my math. God's got different math. He never reveals Himself as three only or one only. In fact, even in the Hebrew, the word for God is a word that looks singular and yet has a plural implication in the marking. He's just letting us know. Well, let's get back onto this. In verse 30. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Do you hear who is in charge of salvation? He is Lord of salvation. There is nothing about salvation that involves me except an invitation to receive him. And I really can't take credit for that because if he did not enlighten me in that split mo moment of the work of the Holy Spirit to realize that I am a sinner and I need a Savior, I would never have been saved. He gives me the light to understand my need and to give me the opportunity to respond. You know how foolish I was with that? I had that enlightenment. I understood that process. For years and years before I finally said yes. And the day that I sat in that pew and I sat in the back putting fingerprints in a songbook because I wasn't going to go down again, right? And something in my mind simply said, Why are you running from Him? Why are you? And I came to the realization he had been calling me and he was drawing me and everything around me in my life that I was a part of in family and in church was all being put together by him. And I realized the reason I was running because I wanted to be God. I wanted to be God over me. I didn't want somebody else to tell me how I was supposed to live. I would be good. Oh, I'll be nice. And I'll do all the things I'm supposed to do. And I'll get the credit for it. And I'll get the glory for it. Because I'm going to be God. Do you know how horrible it is to be your own God in the long run? Let me tell you how bad it is. Jesus says that His way, his burden, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And that's because his burden doesn't have a weight of sin. It doesn't have a weight of fear. It doesn't have a weight of, of constantly trying to control behaviors and all this sort of his burden is one that gives me freedom to be led by a Lord who loves me and who saved me and made me his very own. When well, you remember the passage in Job we talked about, and we're, we're almost there, folks. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God is sovereign. He's going to be sovereign. He continues to be sovereign no matter how people relate to Him. But the question is, is how shall I relate to Him? Colossians 1.15 says this. He is the image of the invisible God. Talking about Jesus. The firstborn of all creation. Now, watch for salvation stuff as we go through here. For by Him all things were created... So he's in charge of creation, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. That means even on an atomic level, things that I can't see, he's the Lord of all of that. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
He is in charge of the spiritual realm that I can't see. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. Is He sovereign God? <coughs> Notice in verse 18 and 19. He is the head of the body, talking about the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything, for it was by the Father's good pleasure that all of the fullness would dwell in Him. In other words, Jesus has, is, the fully God, and yet fully man. And you're going, there's that God math again. That's not possible. Well, you can go over at uh, West Orange, and there are people over there that are 120% committed to football. Why can't God be 200% of something, you know? This is the God that we serve. In verse 20. Now notice this. And through Him, through Jesus, to reconcile all things to Himself, Jesus is working to reconcile all things to God. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. I don't know how many people I've heard talk about the boringness of the gospel and all these horrible things. And yet, folks, sin brought death. And the resolution to the sin problem was death. A sinless God sent His sinless Son to pay a price that I could not pay. His blood was shed, and by that death and in His resurrection, I and you can find salvation. Through Him I say that the things on earth are things in heaven, all reconciled through Him. For by one offering, he is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14. You see the salvation word sanctified? That one offering that he made on the cross. By the faith and trust that I and you can place in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can be perfected for all time by being set apart or sanctified. Will you be perfect in this life? The answer to that is as long as you have a sin nature, you're going to face temptation. Amen? But that sin nature is going to be taken away someday. And everything will change. Notice in Hebrews 10, 23. Because of that, we as a church respond to the Lordship of Jesus. Do you see what our response is? We hold fast to our confession of faith in Jesus and we don't waver in that. We know that He is faithful and so as He is faithful, now I have to be faithful to you and you have to be faithful to me and we have to be faithful to each other to do what? Well, we're going to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And so how are we going to do that if we choose to be a person who's not involved in the body of Christ at all? We're not involved in any church. We're not participating in any group of people and so who are people of faith. And so we have to be together to do that. Notice that we're not forsaking our own assembling together as become the habit of some people. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And folks, you know which day he's talking about. In Lordship, our God has called us to be actively involved in the body. Notice in back in Hebrews 10, this one was well, kind of tiny, isn't it? I'm going to read that for you. By the will, by this will, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Yes. And today you can go to a lot of places that they're going to say Jesus is still dying for our sins. And they, you go to a hospital that they're in charge of and Jesus is still on the cross all over the hospital. 
Still dying for sin. Folks, it was a work that he did once for all. The question is, is have you responded once for all to the work that he did on your behalf? That's the call. Will I respond to the sovereign God? Who is the Lord of your day? Who is the Lord of your life? I, I faced this in this study this week. I'm, I'm going through this and I'm thinking, is my relationship with Jesus about being a good person? Or is it about living my life consistently conscious of Him as an obedient servant? If I'm conscious of Him, His presence with me, if He walks with me, He talks with me, and, you know, and all those things we, we sing about, then it's easier for me to get to the place where I can appreciate the fact that He's helping me deal with temptation. I can appreciate the fact that He's giving me direction of where I'm supposed to go and what I'm supposed to be doing. Time after time in the scripture you have battles in the Old Testament where the people are of Israel are terrified because enemies are coming. And God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. And he gives them specific instructions. I want the singers in the front. He's not trying to kill them all. He wants them to be up there singing, right? He gets it all lined up. He goes out and he has the people stand and watch. And then he wipes out the whole army. He just wipes them out. While the people are watching God do what he does. Folks, you and I fight battles that are not ours to fight. And we wind up getting hurt and bloodied and torn up in some situations because we're trying to take things on in our flesh that are supposed to happen in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so to be an obedient servant means that I'm going to see God do things that I think I should be able to do 